Sutra. Moreover, good men to request the turning of the Dharma wheel is explained like this. Within each and every fine mode of dust in the Buddha lands throughout the ten directions and the three buildings of time throughout the Dharma realm and the realm of empty space, there are vast and great Buddha lands, as many as find most of dust in ineffable the ineffable Buddha lands. In each and every land, in thought after thought, there are all Buddhas accomplishing Ukwa and bright enlightenment. There are number as many as find most of dust in ineffable the ineffable Buddha lands. A sea like assembly of bodhisattvas, circumambulates each Buddha, using all manner of skillful means of body, mouth, and mind. I sincerely and diligently request that they turn the wonderful Dharma wheel. Commentary I will now explain the principle of requesting the turning of the Dharma wheel. Moreover, good men. To request the turning of the Dharma wheel is explained like this. Within each and every fine mode of dust in the Buddha lands throughout the ten directions and the three buildings of time throughout the Dharma realm of the realm of empty space, there are vast and great Buddha lands, as many as fine most of dust in ineffable the ineffable Buddha lands. In each dust mode, are uh, again ineffably ineffable Buddha lands as numerous as find most of dust in vast and great Buddha lands and in each and every land in thought after thought their own Buddhas accomplishing equal and right enlightenment. There are number as many as find most of dust in ineffably ineffable Buddha lands. A sea like assembly of bodhisattvas just as vast as the great sea, sacred members each Buddha, using all manner of skillful means of body, mouth, and mind. I use my body, my, my mouth, and my mind, karma, and all kinds of skillful words, and I sincerely and diligently request that they return the wonderful Dharma will. I request that they turn the great Dharma will of all Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, South Hearers, and those enlightened conditions, that they turn this most wonderful Dharma will, Sutra. So it is that even if the realm of empty space is exhausted, the realms of empty uh, of living beings are exhausted, the karma of living beings is exhausted, and the afflictions of living beings are exhausted. My request that all Buddhas turn the proper Dharma will is without end. It continues in thought after thought without cease. My body, mouth, and mind never weary of these deeds. Commentary I diligently request that the Buddhas turn the wonderful Dharma will. I vow to request that the Buddhas turn the wonderful Dharma will. So it is that even if the realm of empty space is exhausted, when there is no more empty space, the realms of living beings are exhausted. When there are no more living beings, the karma of living beings is exhausted. When the karmic obstructions of living beings have come to an end, and the afflictions of living beings are no more, still my vow to constantly request that all Buddhas turn the proper Dharma will is without end. There is no way my vow can end. It is inexhaustible. My vow continues in thought after thought without cease. This vow continues through each thought continuously and is never cut off. My body, mouth, and mind never weary of this deeds. I never get fatigue. I never feel that this vow is too much trouble and I never think about renouncing it. Sutra. Moreover, good men requesting that the Buddhas remain in the world is explained like this. All Buddhas first come once and numerous eyes as a fine most of dust in all Buddha lands throughout the ten directions and the three buildings of time exhausting the Dharma realm and the realm of empty space. When they are about to enter Paranivana along with all Bodhisattvas, sound hearers, those enlightened to enlightened by conditions, learners and those beyond study, including all good knowing advisors, I ask them 
or not to enter Nirvana. I request that they remain in the water for as many compass as they are find most of dust in all Buddha lands, bringing benefit and bliss to all living beings. So it is that even if the realm of empty space is exhausted, the realms of living beings are exhausted, the karma of living beings is exhausted, and the afflictions of living beings are exhausted. Still, my requesting is endless. It continues in thought after thought without cease. My body, mouth, and mind never weary of these deeds. Commentary. Moreover, good men, requesting that the Buddha's remain in the world is explained like this. I will not explain the meaning of the vow to request that the Buddha's remain in the world. All Buddha's thus commands are numerous as a fine most of dust in all Buddha lands throughout the ten directions and the three builders of time exhausting the Dharma realm and the realm of empty space throughout all of empty space totally pervading all Buddha lands. When they are about to enter Paranivana, after they have finished transforming those with whom they have affinities, the Buddhas wish to manifest entry into Nirvana. When they are about to enter Nirvana, I will already have requested that they not enter Nirvana, but always remain in the world, teaching and transforming living beings. Not only will I ask all Buddhas to dwell eternally in the world, I will also ask the Bodhisattvas, sound hearers, those enlightened to conditions, learners and those beyond study, not to leave the world. Those of the first fruition, the second fruition, and the third fruition are still on the level of learners, whereas those of the fourth fruition are on the level of those beyond study, including all good knowing advisors. Not only will I request all these sages, but I ask all good advisors, Dharma masters, who lecture to trust not to leave the world, in accord with my vow, I ask them all, each and every one of them, not to enter Nirvana so quickly. I request that they remain in the world for as many compass as they are found most of dust in all Buddha lands. I request them to stay with us for a period of time throughout the compass as many as all the fine most of dust in all the Buddha lands, bringing benefit and bliss to all living beings. I wish all Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, sound hearers, those enlightened to conditions, and all good advisors will remain forever in the world and bring benefit to all living beings. So it is that I make my vow like this. Even if the realm of empty space is exhausted, basically the realm of empty space cannot be exhausted, nor can the realms of living beings be exhausted, nor can the karma the comic obstacles of living beings be exhausted, but if even they all could come to an end, my vow to ask all Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, South Hearers, those enlightened to conditions and good advisors to constantly remain in the world would still be endless. It continues in thought after thought without cease. My body, mouth, and mind never weary of these deeds. My vow is inconceivably firm. Sutra, moreover, good men, to always study with the Buddhas, is explained like this. I will be like Varotra, now thus come one of this Saha world who, from the time he first resolved his mind, never retreated from Vigo. He gave up ineffably ineffable numbers of bodies and lives. He peeled off his skill for paper, split his bones to fashion brushes, drew blood for ink, and wrote out sutras text as high as Mount Sumeru. Because he valued the drama, he did not cherish his own body or life. Commentary Moreover, good men, universal worthy again called out to the youth good wealth. What is the meaning of to always study with the Buddhas, it is explained like this. I will now explain it for you. It means to be like Varutrana, the first come one of this Saha world, to be 
Like means to follow the example and try to be the same as Varotrana Buddha. Sangha in Sanskrit, it mean, its meaning is bearable. This wound is very difficult for all creatures to bear, yet they are still able to bear it. How is it that this wound is so difficult for all living beings? In this world, everything is suffering, and even the happiness in this world is not real happiness, but is the cause of suffering. All the dramas in this world are defined and without purity. The world is all bitter and suffering. How is happiness the cause of suffering? For example, most people like to wear new clothes, and putting on a new outfit is considered a happy event. But when you are not careful and spill soap on it or get it dirty some other way, you get afflicted and this is suffering. People especially like wealth, although you acquire much during your life. When you die, you cannot take it with you. Nevertheless, while you are alive, you keep track of every cent. When you are without money, you devise ways to get it, and after you have it, you are afraid you will lose it. If you do not have any wealth, you greedily long for it, and this is suffering. After you get it and are afraid of losing it, this is also suffering. You are not aware of this mental and emotional states as suffering. However, because you are so busy worrying about obtaining and losing it, during your life, you have fears that about not having wealth and fears about losing it. But when you die, you cannot take along one penny. You tell me, is this suffering or happiness? Everyone in the world is fond of these two things, new clothes and wealth, and so this makes good examples. But all the other kinds of happiness are causes for suffering too, because you have not yet awakened to this fact. You are able to bear this wound, and so it is called the Saha wound. Varotrana Buddha is the first come one of the Saha wound, who from the time he first resolved his mind never retreated from Raigo. Varotrana is Sanskrit and means pervading everywhere. It refers to the Dharma body of the Buddha. Nishya Nan Nada Buddha's Dharma body is called Varotrana Buddha. When Shakyamuni Buddha first resolved to attain Bodhi, he met the ancient Shakya and made offerings to him, vowing to be just like him. He was a potter then and made bricks, ties, teacups, and so forth. When he saw the Shakya of old, he vowed never to retreat but to be vigorous in body and mind, day in and day out, and at all time never to be lax or lazy in his cultivation. He gave up ineffably ineffable numbers of bodies and lives. For an ineffably ineffable number of lives, he renounced his body and life and gave them away. For example, before Shakyamuni became a Buddha, he met Burning Lamp Buddha and made an offering to him with his body. Burning Lamp Buddha, walking along the road, had come upon a large puddle of water. Shakyamuni, seeing an old bishu coming, lay down in the water so that the old bishu could walk across his body. This is giving one's body, using one's body to help others. Most of us would think that Shakyamuni's actions were stupid. Could he not have used sticks and balls rather than his body to provide a way for the old bhikshu to cross the water? That is pretty smart, but Shakyamuni Buddha did not think of such an ingenious method. If he had, then it is not certain that Burning Lamp Buddha would have given him a prediction of Buddhahood, because because he would still have had a concern for himself. He still would have had an attachment to his body. Lying in the water showed that he was without a notion of a self, but only wished to help land benefit other beings. He practiced the Bodhisattva path. 
and paying no attention to himself, he lay down in the water to help an old bhikshu walk across a ditch. Shakyamuni was a practicing ascetic at that time, but even though ascetics do not cut their hair or their beards, still they are not hippies, so do not think that Shakyamuni was a hippie. I saw an article written by a Chinese person who said that Confucius was a hippie. This is total rubbish and only amounts to confusing the false with the true and spreading false stories. When Burning Lamp Buddha saw that this bhikshu was so sincere that he laid, he laid down on the road to serve as a bridge across the mud, he made a prediction for Shakyamuni and said, in the future you will become a Buddha. You cultivate the Bodhisattva path in this manner, and I do too. Thus it is, thus it is. In the future you will be a Buddha named Shakyamuni. This is how Shakyamuni Buddha practiced on the cosmic ground, offering up his body and life as gifts. He did this in each life for immeasurable ends past, continue, continuing until the present, perfecting the Bodhisattva path. Varochana Buddha is the pure, all pervasive Dharma body Buddha. Varochana means to pervade everywhere. The Buddha's Dharma body is both non existent and not non existent because there is nowhere that it exists and nowhere that it does not exist. What does it mean to say that there is nowhere that the Dharma body Buddha exists? If we say that there is nowhere that it does not exist, then it is everywhere, but why do we not see it? Since we do not see it, does this not prove that it does not exist? Whether we see it or not, it still exists, because it pervades all places. It is said that there is no place where it does exist, and there is no place where it does not exist. It fills up the entire universe to the ends of the Dharma realm. Someone may ask, you say that it extends everywhere. Does this include filthy places like toilets? Not only does it exist in toilets, but it exists in places which are even more filthy. The Buddha's Dharma body exhausts empty space to the limits of the Dharma realm. The Buddha's Dharma body is neither defined nor pure, neither produced nor destroyed and neither increasing nor decreasing. Shakyamuni Buddha gave his body and life in cultivating the Bodhisattva path to seek the unsurpassed path of the Buddha Dharma body. He peeled off his skin for paper. He stripped skin from his body to use as paper. He split his bones to fashion brushes and drew blood for ink. Shakyamuni Buddha used his bones for pen, his blood for ink, and his skin for paper and rotan sutras stacked, stacked as high as Mount Sumeru. He used his skin for paper, his bones for brushes, and his blood for ink to write out sutras. Why didn't Shakyamuni go buy some paper, brushes, and ink to write out sutras? The principle here is the same as the one which applied when Chakramani Buddha used his body to make a bridge in the mud. You could explain this by saying that there was no paper in India at that time when the sutras were compiled, so Chakramani Buddha could not obtain any paper. What did they use in its place? They wrote out the sutras on palm leaves. If one was to lay out the leaves upon which the Dharma Flower Sutra was written, they would stretch for about two and a half miles. When Shakyamuni Buddha was practicing the Bodhisattva path and seeking the Buddha Dharma, science had not progressed much and there was no such thing as paper as we know it. And certainly no such thing as a paper a company, so paper could not be purchased anywhere, unlike today, when paper is, is easily obtainable and books can be printed easily. Things were not so convenient then. There was nowhere to buy paper, brushes, or ink. 
so he used uh, his skin for paper, his bones for brushes, and his blood for ink to write out the sutras. In China, bamboo was used to write on before paper was invented. Bamboo was split and tied together to make writing tablets. In the past, the book of history, the book of poetry, and the book of changes, and all other all the other ancient classics were written out on bamboo. So do not think that paper, brushes, and ink have always existed. Besides the lack of a place to buy these things, there was another reason for him to use his skin, bones, and blood to write out sutras. He had forgotten himself for the sake of the drama and did not fear suffering. For the sake of the drama, he feared nothing and renounced his blood, bones, and skin to write out sutras. Because he had such dedication, you can say he gave up his body in search of the Buddha drama. He used his skin, bones, and blood to write out a stack of sutras as high as Mount Sumeru. Because he valued the drama, he did not cherish his own body or life in Hong Kong now. There is a monk named Shou Yin. Some years ago at Wu Tai Mountain, he built a small hut and was still both, both there and at Bodhi Temple in Shanghai. Later, he went to Vietnam and built a very large temple, but when the Vietnam War started, he returned to Hong Kong. He used his blood obtained by cutting his tongue and body to write out the flower adorned sutra in Chinese characters two inches high. You can say that his death is inconceivable. He specialized in reciting the Flower Adorno Sutra, bowing to the Flower Adorno Sutra, and practicing the Flower Adorno Buddhimanda. This is a state of Bodhisattva. The Buddha did not even cherish his own body and life. Sutra, how much the less did he crave the king's throne, cities, towns, palaces, gardens, groves, or any material things at all? He exhausted himself to the extreme in the different kinds of difficult ascetic practices. Commentary, in his past lives, Shakyamuni Buddha practiced the difficult, different kinds of or difficult ascetic practices and brought forth a great resolve to attain body for the sake of bringing benefit to all living beings. Therefore, he cherished neither his body nor life, and he did not protect them. How much the less did he crave a king's throne? He did not cherish either his body or his life, and so how much less did he wish to become a king? If Shakyamuni Buddha had not left the home life, he would have been a will-turning sage king. There are four kinds of will turning sage kings the gold will king, the silver will king, the copper will king, and the iron will king. The gold will king rules over all four continents 